Um, so, hello everyone. My name is Joanne Sheehan, um, and I work on the sustainability, renewable energy, and ag tech team in Enterprise Ireland. Um, I just want to welcome everyone. This is the eighth webinar in our Green Transition series. All the recordings from the previous seven webinars um, covering topics including B Corp, ESG and sustainability reporting, green financing and the SME Climate Hub are available on our website. And today's webinar will be recorded and up on our website um, not too soon after, after today's session. Um, there'll be a small bit of space for a Q&A at the end of the webinar today and you can put questions in the chat and um, we'll pick them up as we go. Um, so um, the agenda for today is as follows. Our keynote speaker we're very lucky to have um, is Dr. Geraldine Brennan, whose presentation will focus on closing the circular innovation gap and accelerating the net zero carbon circular economy in Ireland. Um, we'll then have a panel discussion, but before I introduce our speakers, I just want to highlight Enterprise Ireland's upcoming um, sustainability Kickstarter workshops. So these are starting this Friday, the 27th of October, and will be running every second week up until the end of the year. And the Kickstarters are free and have been developed to help companies understand the importance of sustainability and ESG to their business. Um, they're not webinars, they're workshops, and they have been designed with a very specific outcome in mind. Every participant will walk away with a sustainability action plan relative to their business. Um, so as a call to action at the end of today's webinar, I urge anyone who's listening who is an Enterprise Ireland client company, a local enterprise office client company, or an Uderos Nguyeltukta client company uh, to sign up to a Kickstarter. Um, I'll talk more about the Kickstarters at the end, um, but now let me introduce um, our speakers today. So Dr. Geraldine Brennan is, Brennan is the Head of Circular Economy at Irish Manufacturing Research, IMR, an Enterprise Ireland and IDA supported technology centre. Um, within IMR's Sustainable Manufacturing Division, Geraldine leads the Circular Economy Unit and the national flagship Circular Economy Initiative, Circular. Um, which is Ireland's first industry-led public-private partnership dedicated to scaling circular innovation. Geraldine is a strategic circular economy expert, systems thinker, and senior leader with over 15 years of multi-sectoral experience working horizontally and laterally in industry applied research, sustainability consulting, advertising and communications. She has a track record of building public private partnerships to deliver on the circular economy's transformation potential. Um, Geraldine holds a PhD in strategic management and sustainable development and has authored thought leadership on scaling circular innovation. So we're very lucky to have Geraldine um, today. Um, joining Geraldine for the panel um, later on is Fergus O'Sullivan, who is plant manager in um, Ar Arista, um, which is an international bakery company with a leadership posi position in um, Convenience Bakery. Um, Paul Farrell, who is the joint CEO of Farrell Furniture. Paul has over 40 years experience in the furniture industry, um, providing leadership, strategic vision and direction for Farrell. And Paul is dedicated to stimulating an environment for innovation and aligning customer objectives with the commercial ambitions of the business throughout. Um, and also Kevin Cronin, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Free Foam Building Products. Kevin has over 20 years experience with free foam building products, a qualified management accountant. Kevin is also is currently the COO at Free Foam. Um, he's responsible for the strategic development and deployment of operational excellence and sustainability at Free Foam and has headed up many innovative and transformative um, circular projects at Free Foam. So um, without further ado, um, I'll hand over to Geraldine, um, who will um, go through a presentation today and speak to us about all things circular economy. Thank you, Geraldine. Thank you, Joanne, for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today. Give me one second and I'll just share my screen and I'll get started. So, 
So uh, just before we kick off on this whistle-stop tour of all things circular economy, um, I just wanted to flag that this week is International Circular Economy Week, reflecting the fact that circular economy is something that is becoming increasingly mainstream. And I'm delighted to be here today to talk about the uh, work that's been done across the island of Ireland uh, to foster and accelerate circular economy. Uh, as Joanne flagged, uh, Irish Manufacturing Research is an Enterprise Ireland and IDA Ireland supported technology center. We were established in 2014. And our raison d'etre is to demystify, de risk, and deliver emerging technologies, processes, and concepts like circular economy. We work across four key thematic pillars, all of which oriented towards supporting industry to capture and create value and ultimately deliver industry uh, impact through digitization, automation and control, design for manufacturing and sustainable manufacturing where I sit. As Joanne highlighted, Circularia is Ireland's first industry-led public-private partnership ded dedicated to working with Irish industry to scale circular innovation. We, uh, Irish Manufacturing Research is the Secretariat. We co-designed uh, this initiative over 2019 in collaboration, oh, apologies, my slide jumped, in collaboration with our catalyst funders, which were the Department of the Environment, Climate and Communications, the Environment Protection Agency and EIT Climate Kick with 25 founding members. And I'm delighted to have three of those founding members from three different sectors, uh, the food and drinks, agri-food, uh, built environment, and plastic sector with me today to share their stories about the, their journey towards circular economy. You can see we have different industrial clusters, um, and we've grown from that founding membership base of 25 to almost 60 companies to date. In 20, at the end of 2022, the Department of Environment, Climate and Communications um, committed to transition funding as sole strategic partner for this initiative. Very quickly, there's five key ways that we support Irish industry to capture circular advantage. One has been around raising awareness of what the circular economy is. Uh, we have Ireland's first open access knowledge library, which has a whole bunch of interesting artifacts from case studies to policy documents to thought leadership, both from a national perspective, but also internationally for anyone who's embarking on this journey. Well worth a look. We also do a lot of work around knowledge sharing, uh, both within our membership base and outside of it in the wider ecosystem. We run thematic working groups. We've run a range on topics like the circular bioeconomy, circular procurement, circular design, circular plastics, more recently looking at how to redirect finance flows and end of the end of waste and byproducts regulation. All of the outputs of those processes are available and are open access, including seminars and, and recordings from the different uh, dissemination webinars we've run over the last couple of years. Another key area we work is around fostering our memberships engaging in policy dialogues um, from running policy town halls to submitting uh, cross sectoral consultations to key national and European policy consultations. We also have developed capacity building tools, so we have a action plan development process. We also have an online maturity uh, self assessment toolkit. We also established Ireland's first circular economy innovation fund. Um, we had 1.5 million euro where we funded pilots. I will touch on some of those. Some of our members uh, who are going to be sharing their insights with you today uh, were leading those pilots. We've established Ireland's first dedicated circular economy accelerator. We've had 21 companies come through that process. And the last area we work is uh, in wider ecosystem collaboration through our engagement in the ISO Standards Development Committee for Circular Economy Standards, also in OECD working groups, and through a European network of um, circular economy networks, so effectively a network of networks, all of which geared towards fostering greater uptake of circular economy in their respective member states and through relationships across the European Union. So what is the circular economy? It's a really good question. When we talk to uh, companies about this, we see different uh, ideas come to mind when people hear the word circular economy. The fact of the matter is there are many ways to be circular. And the answer is, you know, what does the circular economy mean to your business? Will be it, it will depend. But you can see in this word cloud concepts like repair, which you'd be familiar with, reuse, remanufacturing, recycling. Recycling is a key part of the circular economy, but so is concepts like industrial symbiosis, green chemistry, reverse logistics, disassembly, product life extension, product service systems. 
Um, I read a, a study a couple of years ago that said there were over 42 different types of strategies to implement the concept of circularity. So a key message to take from all of that is the fact that the circular economy is much more than recycling. Don't get me wrong, recycling is a key part of it. The circular economy builds off the back of recycling. But ultimately, the circular economy is trying to create feedback loops between within companies' operations, within value chains, and also between value chains to keep materials, components, and products in use in the economy for longer through that range of strategies that I highlighted. And over the course of my presentation today, I will seek to bring circular economy to life for you. So what are the first, before I go into examples of some case studies and then go into the deep dive with Arista, uh, Farrell and Freefoam, I just wanted to highlight some of the key drivers and enablers as well as the benefits of the circular economy. One of the key drivers has, over the last decade or so has been the recognition of the fact that our consumption models have a significant negative impact. Almost 90% of biodiversity loss and water stress are directly related to our consumption of natural resources and the extraction and processing of materials. In addition, half of greenhouse gas emissions come from material extraction and processing. The good news, the circular economy is key to decarbonization and it's a key innovation paradigm that can help companies value chain sectors and economies decarbonize. So we know now, based on uh, the research over the last number of decades, that ultimately 45% of emissions are associated with products and their use. And these connect to key materials. If we can address those through the circular economy, like food, steel, cement, plastic, and aluminium, we are in a way to ultimately decarbonize our economy. Another key driver for circular economy practices uh, and business models is the fact that we've witnessed uh, extreme resource price volatility continued over the last number of years. And that's also been coupled with increased logistics costs. I've heard reports from many of our members about the fact that, and others actors in, in, in Ireland, about the shift from just-in-time manufacturing to just-in-case, so the hoarding on inventory because of the challenges with supply chains. The circular economy is a way to reduce this. Another key enabler of circularity is the fact that uh, we have got to a point in our industrial revolution where digitalization and technologies are mature. Ultimately, understanding where your materials, components or products are, what state they are in, enables companies to get things back to them or get back to third parties who can repair or refurbish them. Another key driver at a macro level is the European Union, the policy, their commitment through uh, the Green Deal to a twin transition, which is both green and digital. A key specific policy um, that is worth flagging is the Eco Design for Sustainable Products Regulation. I won't be able to go into all the, the elements of how this connects into the Circular Economy Action Plan, but I just want to bring your attention to the fact that it requires performance and information requirements for greener products. It sets tackle the destruction of unsold goods, uh, reduce waste and um, prevent waste, including development of mandatory criteria for green public procurement. Public procurement and private procurement is another key driver of circular economy and enabler of circular economy. Another connected element is, and as I mentioned around digitalization, is the um, forthcoming digital product passport and the re related labeling rules as well as the fact that there will be stronger market surveillance with regards to sustainability and circular economy criteria uh, for products placed on the EU markets. And all of this is about making sustainability and circularity the norm and creating a more resilient single market. Another key driver for the adoption of circular economy by industry is the sustainable finance tax taxonomy and the corporate sustainability reporting directive because circular economy is a specific objective and reporting area in both of these key mechanisms, which are driving how um, the finance sector is gonna invest in industry. So now bringing uh, a spotlight to some of the drivers from an Irish perspective, particularly some of the policy drivers, and then I will touch on, on the benefits and the opportunities from an Irish perspective before heading to cases. So essentially, 
there was, there is um, a so-called circular innovation gap in Ireland. It was estimated by the EPA in 2019 that we use over 100 million tons of materials annually. There was a study that the EPA commissioned back in 2013, almost 20, uh, 10 years ago now, that a 5% improvement could yield over 2 billion euro per annum for the Irish economy. A follow-up study in 2019 said that ultimately this opportunity hadn't yet to be capitalized on. And when we, when IMR, in collaboration with our uh, founding companies, as well as our strategic partners, were building the business case for Circulera, we recognized and highlighted the fact that there's this knowledge and awareness raising um, gap, as well as a capacity building um, specifically within companies around circular economy needs for you. And then ultimately, if you can address general awareness and knowledge around circular economy, if you can build capacity and understanding of what it means specifically for your business, where you are in your supply chain and in your sector, that ultimately fosters and leads and um, converts into implementation of circular economy practices. So some, some significant milestones in Ireland's transition to a circular economy. Um, at the end of December 2021, the Department of Environment, Climate and Communications published the whole of government circular economy strategy, which ultimately um, sets the ambition for Ireland to um, achieve the uh, an average circular economy material use rate. So uh, Ireland is currently um, a, has a very low material use rate connected to that um, uh, economic opportunity I highlighted. The following year, um, and this is a significant landmark Circular Economy Act, uh, where the circular economy was written into law and placed on statutory footing. Um, basically, what that means is that regardless of um, uh, subsequent governments, the circular economy is not going away. It's much like the Climate um, Act, which you probably heard from in previous webinars. Ultimately, the, the Irish government recognizes that climate action and circular economy go hand in hand, and they are fundamental in order for Ireland to achieve its uh, decarbonization targets um, by 2030 and 2050. Another key development, again, that's driving uh, the shift and transition towards circularity for Irish industry is the fact, and as I said, connected to this interconnection between climate action and circularity is the announcement of sectoral emission ceilings. And then I suppose, and this is a whistle stop tour, I'm afraid, um, but kind of bringing that all together, ultimately the drivers in a very practical way for companies, and uh, I'll invite Arista and Farrell and Free Firm to share their perspective on these drivers and which ones have been key to them. There are cost savings from looking and going on, on structural waste hunts to look where there are inefficiencies in your business and where waste is occurring and could be prevented or valorized, meaning value could be created from it by turning it into an ingredient for something else if you're in the food sector or uh, recycling it back into a process. There's also new revenue opportunities from um, looking at your business through a circular economy lens. There's huge opp opportunities connected to environmental performance connected to ESG and things like the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. The circular economy is fundamentally an innovation opportunity, as I flagged earlier as a key driver uh, and why companies across the world are embracing circular economy. It's about that resilience to supply chain shocks, the, po the potential to reshore, perhaps source your materials um, on the island of Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland or in Europe. It's also really about future-proofing your business and then it's ultimately about um, ensuring that you are in compliance with the regulations that are coming down the tracks from a European perspective. So some of the benefits and opportunities, there are macroeconomic benefits, um, economic growth and resource cost savings, the job creation and job retention opportunities from reshoring or creating secondary raw material markets, the environmental benefits I've, I've flagged and it's connected to some of the drivers for why industry are embracing circular economy because of the decarbonization potential. The fact that it also contributes, contributes to several UN Sustainable Development Goals. From a, from a business perspective, I've flagged already the resilience to resource price volatility and supply chain shocks. The potential for new revenue models and value creation opportunities, perhaps from, from shifting to 
uh, offering uh, a repair or remanufacturing business model through a product service system as opposed to direct sales. These also tend to lead to different customer relationships and enhanced customer loyalty because you have repeat engagement with your clients. From a social perspective, the benefits are around job creation uh, and job retention, and also about providing quality work at um, high uh, quality work at a, a variety of skill levels. And then the financial saving, savings and consumer empowerment that comes from engaging with keeping products in use in the economy. In terms of the opportunities, uh, again, I, I'll, I'll highlight a study that flagged a, a quite a detailed study that looked at different sectors and highlighted that food and beverages, pharmaceuticals, chemicals, non-metallic mineral products, construction, retail, accommodation, food services were the sectors where the biggest resource productivity, circular economy opportunities ex uh, exist in the context of, of the Irish economy. We've done, uh, through Circular's work, uh, a huge amount of work on a range of different opportunities, and I don't unfortunately have the capacity to cover all of them, but I just wanted to draw your attention to the different sectoral guides, good practice guides, which highlight different opportunities, the state of the sector, and best practice both nationally and internationally, oh, apologies, uh, across from agriculture and the bio-based industries, in the context of transport, so road and rail, in the context of aviation, ICT and electronics, food and drinks, construction, the built environment, textiles and fashion, and maritime and shipping. So those are all available online on our online repository. So shifting tack now, I just wanted to highlight a couple of examples that, that again, if we go back to that, that word cloud I showed you with all these different words, which you know perhaps have different meanings, and you might be going, what is, um, what are we talking about when we say revalorization, or for example, industrial symbiosis? So industrial symbiosis is about this concept of thinking about waste as a resource. So effectively, the, the byproduct or residual from one production process or one product might be an input or a resource into another. The example that you're looking at, Carno, is a case study of a French venture who went data centers and computing creates heat, waste heat. I wonder if we could come up with a distributed um, computing model, could we turn radiators, could we design a radiator that ultimately is a distributed uh, computer? So effectively, you have in public buildings in a, in a part of France, you have radiators that are ultimately computers and the waste heat that's generated through these distributed data centers are heating buildings. And that's an example of how circular economy is really turning things on, the, on its head. An example of industrial symbiosis that's a bit closer to home, a sister project of IMRs was called Symbiobeer. And this was uh, funded by the EPA and fostering a collaboration between St. Mel's Brewery and Penalto Foods. These were two, uh, a microbrewery and an industrial baker who are in the same um, industrial park. And effectively, what we looked at was how we could take um, red residues and use it as a substitute for malted grain in order to produce a new beer. This product was launched in December 2021. Another example of circular economy in the context of reuse and the, uh, the idea of thinking about designing um, circular configurations or systems, Loop Store is an initiative by TerraCycle, a US-based company that's working with different brands to essentially roll out a zero-waste packaging, refillable, reusable packaging system. And ultimately, what it is looking and trialing is ultimately moving away from single-use uh, materials. In the context of um, long-lived or medium-lived goods, uh, equipment, refurbishment and remanufacturing are key strategies that can be deployed. The example that I have up here is uh, from Toyota Material Handling, and they realized that the um, Effectively, the 70% of their carbon footprint came from the raw materials to produce their trucks and mostly from the metal production. So they uh, looked at a second life strategy where they guarantee, they refurbish and they guarantee the performance of second life um, forklifts. This strategy has also been applied in the context of medical equipment. Uh, again, in the States, Philips Diamond Select has uh, developed an offering 
again, to um, highlight that there is still value in equipment that ultimately is has had a second life. I have a range of different stories that I could share, um, but unfortunately, as I said, this is a whistle stop tour. I just wanted to draw your attention to the cross sectoral uh, pilots that uh, Circulera has funded from the context of the electronic sector to agri food to fashion and textiles and furnitures. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the furniture project led by Farrell, um, the, um, the construction project led by um, Free Foam and uh, but I just wanted to flag that there's a wealth of inspiration if you're if you're looking to kind of follow up on some Irish use cases, and I encourage you to take a look at these. So to kind of um, set the scene for the panel discussion, I just wanted to uh, do a, a quick overview of some of the work that Circulera has been doing with um, our members, Arista Farrell and Free Firm in particular. Um, and I hope I do justice to their efforts and I look forward to the, the panel discussion in a minute. So just starting with Arista. So uh, for Arista, as Joanne flagged, they're uh, a leading industrial baker based in Grange Castle, County Dublin. And circular economy is, is key part of their ESG initiatives. They do a range of activities across energy, carbon reporting, food waste, um, non-food waste packaging and social sustainability. Uh, they work with Food Cloud, they're ISO registered, they're, a, as I said, a founding member of Circulera and part of Origin Green. And very recently, um, and Fergus will be able to tell you a little bit more, uh, they a, uh, were announced as the EPA's Food Waste Charter Champion for the bakery sector. So this is an initiative driven by the EPA to encourage uh, food waste prevention and reporting in order to um, reduce uh, through circular economy practices and resource efficiency, the, um, the loss, uh, the emissions that comes from food waste in the food and manufacturing processing sector. Moving to uh, Farrell Furniture, uh, as Joanne flagged, uh, Farrell Furniture, uh, Paul is a, a joint CEO of Farrell Furniture, which is a family run furniture manufacturer operating in RD uh, County Laos. He, uh, Farrell Furniture, were uh, an awardee of Circulaires Innovation Fund in 2020 uh, in collaboration with the OPW and Atlantic Technological University. And the Do More With Less pilot was a um, example of a furniture take back scheme because I don't wanna speak uh, on Farrell's behalf, but they have a long lived product. And the key thing was how they could potentially get it back and also how, given that they are a B2B manufacturer, they could work with the OPW to shift from green to circular procurement. The pilot impacts uh, delivered over a, a th one ton of a material recovery, three tons of carbon diverted from disposal, and also proved that there were cost savings with regards to the um, maintenance and product life extension of a Krana chair. It had implications for um, government tendering as well as the potential for government to invest in new track and trace software in order to foster circularity. Last but not least is uh, free foam building products. Uh, Kevin is, uh, so sorry, free foam building products. Before I go into the, the pilot example here, they're a PVC uh, fascia, Sophia and rainwater system manufacturer who are headquartered in Cork. The uh, diagram you have in front of you is summarizing the circular economy power of many pilot, which was a B2B construction take back. So ultimately, um, Free Foam, as the manufacturer of its product, was seeking to uh, take back for everything, including packaging connected to uh, their products once it had been installed, working in partnership with their, um, their customer Mulligan Guttering and Glen Bay Homes, the end user. And ultimately, uh, in this pilot, Shabra um, Plastics Manufacturer was involved in order to uh, find circular economy opportunities to valorize uh, any uh, waste materials. You can see there on the right-hand side that there were some significant impacts that came from the project from prevention, looking at packaging redesign to remove the use of polypropylene tape, leading to um, over almost 100,000 euros worth of savings, over 25 tons of packaging materials diverted from recycling to reuse, 
over 50,000 and 50,000 euros annual savings, 12 tons of material on the Glenbay sites being diverted from energy recovering to recycling and reuse, and many more, many more opportunities that I'm sure uh, Kevin can speak to. So that's me. I'd like to invite uh, Fergus O'Sullivan, Paul Farrell, and Kevin Cronin to and uh, to turn their cameras on and join me in a conversation around uh, your journey towards the circular economy. So I'm going to stop sharing my slides. You're very welcome. Um, thank you, Kevin, Fergus, thank you. and Paul, yeah. for coming and joining us today. So, Paul, uh, as you're on the screen, I'm going to start with you. I'll put you in the hot seat. Uh, no problem. No problem. What, what I wanted to, to, and this is going to come to all of you, is I think uh, what I wanted to understand a bit more, and I know some of this, but, but it'd be good to share it with, with others on the call today, is what has motivated you and your organization to begin the transition towards a circular economy? And of the different drivers and benefits that I've flagged, do any of them strike you as particularly relevant to your business context? Right. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, we, as 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 Geraldine said, we're a family business, uh, sixty-two years old, based here in RD County Louth. We would be one of the major uh, employers in the town, um, um, with with one hundred and twenty people employed. But um, we we have um, air natural raw material is is a very scarce product in in that it's a it's a timber, you know, and um, I uh, I'm second generation third generation is here and the fourth generation are here well the, the third generation are, are starting the business and the fourth generation have been born so I'm lucky enough to have five grandchildren and I want them to have grandchildren and so we we set about I got involved with Circle Air and Geraldine through a conference we went to but I'm a firm believer if we look after the planet the planet will look after us you know so so that that's the, the the romantic side of the story, but also um, the simple fact of the matter is that if if you're if you're green, if you're lean and mean, you you will it it will give us a competitive advantage. And I believe you know with the whole new, uh, we have to we have to be sustainable. We have to use our scarce materials, get the best value out of them, and and the whole idea of creating waste is, is a massive impact to the business. It costs a fortune to get rid of it. You know what I mean? And, and, and you know, so why not reuse it? Why not repurpose it? And so when with our involvement with IMR and particularly with Circulera, we started to look at this and we came up with the idea. We, we applied for, for some funding on a year or two. I think we applied for the funding and we were unsuccessful. And then on the second second application, year three, we were successful and had a pilot, a pilot scheme. Thank you, Paul. Do you want Do you want to add anything else, or shall I? I I'll, I'll... Well, I'm just not sure. I I I I'm I'm happy to talk about the scheme, but maybe you want to go around the different people. Yes, let's do that. We'll we'll talk about lessons learned next. So, Kevin, I might come to you next, and then on to you, Fergus. So, Kevin, what has motivated Free Foam uh, on your journey towards a circular economy? Hi everyone. Um, thanks, Geraldine. Um, for free form, I suppose it was about building on our lean journey. We've been supported by Enterprise Ireland to undertake a lean plus program, um, and we learned all about Tim Woods and the eight ways. And obviously, material is a big part of that over processing, over production. Um, we but we were kind of internally focused in that regard. So we wanted to move up the waste hierarchy. To get away, we were doing a lot of good things around recycling. And joining Circle Air seemed to be the natural next step uh, along our kind of operational excellence journey, um, focusing on circularity, redesign, reuse, um, and elimination, and you know reducing uh, what materials we were using. So we kind of had some push from our push and pull. We had push from our suppliers were talking to us about what they were doing around circularity. Uh, our team were, were very interested in it because we were eliminating waste uh, at all at all levels as best we could going through the, the Lean Plus programs. Um, and then we anticipated we were going to get pulled from our customers. We knew they were going to start asking us, what's our carbon footprint? How do we reduce? Can we reduce the carbon footprint? What are we doing around, not just recycling, but to reduce that carbon footprint? And we knew uh, 
kind of getting involved in looking at circular uh, business models was going to help us in that regard. And certainly that's happened, uh, especially in the last two years we've seen since we joined Circulera, uh, a lot of our customers um, very much focused on that. Thank you, Kevin. Fergus, Arista's journey in this space. Yeah, uh, a lot of similarities to Kevin. I think, I suppose we've had ISO 14,000. We've always been environmentally aware for the last probably eight years. And we, with that, we've had objectives and we, we've monitored our environmental effects. But over the past number of years, I suppose it's 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 got got, got a lot different with carbon emissions and that. And it, it helps greatly that we're part of a large group. There are over 32 sites in Arista. And the the group has a very strong and detailed DSG agenda. And uh, we're very much part of that. And that's driving us in that direction. Like Kevin, we also, a lot of our customers are large UK and Ireland uh, multiples. And they are very demanding in our environmental credentials. They're almost demanding scope three emission publications and that. And finally, I suppose, nearly everything you do with circularity and, and waste minimization is you save money. And uh, we're very much down that route as well. So I suppose company, being part of a large group, customers, and overall, I suppose it's our responsibility to the environment, but company, customers, and cost savings. Thank you, Fergus. And I suppose that's the thing. Ultimately, a circular economy model is about decoupling resource use from growth. So the idea is that it is an economic way, it's an economic model, it's a business model. It is meant to deliver cost savings and create value. Thank you. So my next question is, if someone were to tap you on the shoulder, given that all of you have been on this journey for a number of years, different years, different journeys, what would be the key lessons learned from your journey that you would share with those listening in today? So the things you wish someone else had tapped you on the shoulder a couple of years ago and said, think about this if you're going to go on this journey towards the circular economy as part of your sustainability journey. And I'll I'll look to someone who, you know, I'll give you a second and, and see who wants to wants to respond first. I suppose I'll I'll give a quick answer and say knowledge is is everything. I think by being members of Circulera, by being part of a large Arista group, it's it's essential that you know, like we've got SSE electricity grants. We've got EI grants. We have some very good projects. We'd love to learn other projects that other companies are doing, but it's to try and get as much information from the industry peers. Like I've said it to you before, uh, Geraldine, I think having food industries kind of joining together, it's difficult with competitor bakeries. We can't all tell each other the but a, a wider group industry where you tell of initiatives where like we're putting in air doors and we're reducing refrigeration suction temperatures and they're going to save us a lot of money. But I'm sure Kevin has a number of other, Paul as others, and, and to get that knowledge from the industry peers. Knowledge sharing is, is critical to fast track implementation. Paul, Kevin, you both unmuted yourselves at the same time. Who'd like to go first? <laughs> I, I have no problem. It, it, it's, it's, it's funny, we, we're all talking more or less from the same vein, but, but I have to be honest, the biggest lessons learned here, on, unlike the, my two colleagues here, um, we're a small enough business, um, we don't have that much external um, management, um, myself and my brother are here, and then there's a team that has been built up around my father, and now we've inherited. So, 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 I uh, I had a bit of a passion and a grow for this, and again, like like the guy said, it has been driven by our customers. Our customers want green, they want sustainability, they want ESG responsibility, they want all this, and you know, so so we set up a small team internally here to do that, and um, like like Kevin, 
we 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 are on a, a lean program now a long time and um the, the waste end of it wasn't the environmental impact side of it wasn't grabbed so my biggest learning set the team up it, and and you need to grasp other members like it i have a passion and a grow for it and i want it done but you need people to be have the same interest and it, it, it's very hard you know but and then people leave and that's that's another massive problem like the main guy in it for me left after we won the, the business Irish business design award for the project and to get going again now is really really hard um but but also it there's, there's a big responsibility on the clients like we are technically in 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 the EI world, we're we're classed as construction, even though we're furniture manufacturer. And with the OPW, we made a, a lot of people on the call here will know about the decentralization back in two thousand and four. We made them two thousand them ten thousand desks, and the do more with less program project was about taking that stuff back and repurposing it, reusing it, and we proved. We proved it could be done and there was a benefit. But the big thing we need is for the client to actually buy these products. And then we can remanufacture. We, we, remanufacturing office furniture was massive in America back in the 2010s, right? And and massive. And we can do all that. But when you're going back to a client and you're getting a desk off, you're taking it back, you're repolishing it, re it, you're reworking it, it's all labor. And unfortunately, the labor costs a lot of money in this country. And so, like, we need assistance. You, you know, we need, we like, like, like Fergus said, uh, Enterprise Ireland, the Circular Arab people, all these, they, they are funding and helping. But funding is a big, big part of this. But for me, it's, it's both things. We, we, it, you need to push, but you need to pull, you, you know, and, and it sometimes it's very hard to do the pollen. <laughs> that's all I'll say. So that's that's really it, Geraldine. Thank you, Paul. So I think again that there's lessons around setting up a team. So it needs to be a sh something that is shared, and also that element of customers also recognizing that there may be a cost to keeping a product because of the labor investment. That there's a there is at this moment in time a premium despite the cost savings for. Uh -huh. Actually, it's it's very relevant. You know, if, if you know, you talk about fast fashion now in the fabric industry, and 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 furniture and environments. People, you know, it is getting very trendy, and you have to have the latest thing in in the Google office and all this crap. It's it's funny, you know, but it is a fashion type of product, you know. Thank you, Kevin. Would you like to chime in about your lessons learned? Yes. Um... I suppose um, what we've learned is that every material that comes in to a company but that it buys in or sells out is an opportunity for circularity. Um, if it can be reused and recirculated, no, I'd say go and do it. And if it can't be, then you need to redesign it so it can be. Um, so I think that's the lessons we've learned and we've done a lot of that. And we've published a lot of case studies, I guess, to try and... We want two things. We want to learn from everyone else. That's why it's been great to be in part of Circular because you're learning what other companies and collaborations are doing, but also we're sharing what we've done. And none of it is rocket science. As I say, it's straightforward, simple things. It's we be saying to ourselves, why didn't we do this sooner? But we wanted to share that so that hopefully our suppliers and customers will share with us as well what they want, what they're doing, and maybe some opportunities that they see around circular economy that we can we can take on. So that's really it. And, and I'd say I'd echo what uh, Fergus and Paul have said, you know, we can say we can try and help save the planet and save money in a lot of cases at the same time. It doesn't have to be a huge cost burden. There's a lot of low hanging fruit, a lot of good opportunities where you can uh, keep materials in uh, upcycled and in, re in reuse and save money at the same time. And I think it's what's what, what all of you have kind of highlighted is the fact that some of the things, uh, the, the sharing opportunities uh, between sectors and within sectors around, as you say, it's not rocket science. So this idea of trying to get use cases out there so that others can fast track and perhaps replicate or in, an, in, an, in a context appropriate way, but ultimately share that knowledge to highlight where those easy circular economy practices are and how to get them implemented 
uh, as you said, uh, you wish you'd done them sooner, but I, I, I really like the way you kind of highlighted that every material coming in, I just want to reiterate it, every material coming in and every, every material leaving your site is an opportunity for the circular economy. And as you said, if you can't reuse it, repurpose it, remanufacture it or recycle it, then you need to redesign it. That is a very succinct way of summarizing, uh, I suppose, that macro circular economy opportunity. Thank you, Kevin. Well, I'll just say, Geraldine, in, 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 in the woodwork space at the minute, we've set up a group, the Irish Woodwork Interiors Network Group. Yes, and, IWN. And, and we we generally, we, we, we well, during the COVID, they were brilliant. You know, we all talked with things, what was going on, what were they doing? But we now, you know, there, there's, there's, I'd say there's quarterly events and we share stuff and we actually talk and, you know, and, uh, you know, people, people have asked me about the circularity and what, what is this circular stuff, you know, and you talk, you know, so, so the network groups are great. And then even going to the circ to be a member of the circular and to go to their quarterly things is, is fantastic, you know, and even here, we, we depending on what kind of projects we are running through the place, we tend to keep the waste, you know. So we do have trailers full of it because we know, okay, well, we'll get a job that needs a bigger top or a bigger panel, and you know, and we'll use it back up. So, uh, look, so it's it's good to talk to everybody, you know. And Paul, it sounds like uh, what the what what Farrell through both lean and engage with the circular uh, there is a recognition that there is value in waste, and that's another key element of circular economy: recognizing that there is there is economic value, there's environmental emissions, there's carbon emissions, but there's value in everything that is ultimately wasted, and that's kind of what we're trying to turn on its head with this whole circular economy paradigm. Great. Well, um, my last question for the panel is just uh, actually I've got two. So feel free to answer either because I can see Joanne. Thanks for coming in and giving us that that kind of five minute warning. Um, do you have any recommendations on what needs to happen next to foster and accelerate circular economy adoption in your sector? Or do you have or see any key opportunities for your supply chain or for sectoral collaboration to unlock circular economies. So, if you could wave a magic wand to kind of key to uh, accelerate circular economy adoption, um, Paul, in the context of your B two B business, what what would it be? What would you like to see? Uh, you're in the hot seat because you're on the main screen. <laughs> the magic, the magic wand for me would be now. We have a couple of different sectors, but the magic. The magic wand to me would be for people, um, the, the influencers, and I mean the top top tier of the people, that it is okay to use secondhand, you, you know what I mean? Or, or reuse is okay. Like, like um, and I mean in, in, in maybe the Google's offices or somebody like that, and uh, like, like the amount of office furniture, the office furniture market, in, in the UK is worth over a billion a billion sterling, right? And it it's massive, right? And mm. uh, 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 but they don't talk, and the, the the statistics for Ireland wouldn't be that good, in fairness, right? But um, uh, they, they they don't they don't talk about the Irish market in general. But if if people talk about you know if you empty an office block, right, you dispose of all the timber, environmentally friendly. Does that mean? It's it's born, or does that mean it's it's filled in a hole? There's actually some materials that are constantly being specified, right? That are really, it, it, they're they're so harmful. It is dig a hole and bury them. You know, it wouldn't be unlike asbestos, except it won't biodegrade. You know, so so the people that are specifying projects, they need to broaden their minds, broaden the horizons. You know, like if 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 we damage a car, we go out and we repaint it. You don't get a new car. You know what I mean, and and you know so then you need um and I I think as Kevin intimated earlier there we we as designers of furniture we need to design with the end in mind like there's people out there in 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 um at this one company there in Denmark and they're massive into kitchens for build to rents and stuff but what they do is it's it's a little bit more expensive to buy their product but they're basically buying it so that. In if the students break a door, 
or the break of the gable, you can actually take that gable off, replace it. You know what I mean? Rather than buying a whole new unit. So there's there 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 is loads of different opportunities, but people that are doing the buying, that are doing the specifying, they have to be willing to look at different alternatives. Yeah. You know. It's so very, that's my magic. It's a very key point. And, and, and as a slight segue, the um the green public procurement uh, action plan and strategy is currently under consultation and it's looking at specifying reuse so that government procurement public procurement can be act as a market builder for sustainable and circular products but that's a little bit of a segue Paul. So we won't we won't go there just yet no, um, no, to, no. i've got a, a minute or two each for kevin and fergus before i hand back to joanne kevin would you like to go next and then i'll, I'll fergus i'll come to you last yeah um i suppose uh, how do we accelerate the transition um for us to scale and roll out our pilot scheme further, the major challenge for us is end of waste and, and byproduct regulation. And we've been able to take the learnings uh, from the pilot we, we've completed in Ireland and uh, implemented in the UK very quickly, very easily and very cost effectively. So very low cost within a couple of weeks. Uh, unfortunately, we're unable to currently replicate that in Ireland. Um, so without going into it, the situation in Ireland is we'd have to, potentially, we don't know whether it's a waste or not waste. We may or may not need a waste license to collect it, to transport it, and to reprocess it. Um, and that's very expensive and very uh, long uh, waiting time, I believe, to, to get that. And the amount of material you might recover probably wouldn't justify it uh, based on the cost and the expense and the time you'd have to wait and, and to go through. So that's a big, that's a big challenge. So if magic wand, uh, I'd say we need to stop labeling materials as waste. Um, we need regulations to focus more on eliminating the use of non-reusable or non-recyclable materials. And then everything can become circular as it must be designed for that purpose. And waste then is a thing of the past and materials have multiple lives. So I think that magic wand time, that's, that's I think recommendations of, that will accelerate circularity for me. Thank you, Kevin. Fergus, the last word. Uh, <laughs> um, I suppose, I think the EPA, Enterprise Ireland, Circulera, and even our energy suppliers with, with grants that facilitate new projects and for training uh, of, we're lucky we're in a large group. We still would like more knowledge. We still would like, we, the EPA Waste Charter will be helpful. Uh, Circle Air have been very helpful, Enterprise Ireland have been helpful, and I think in this country we need to maybe be more unified and, and, and promote circularity and reduction of carbon emissions and, and health industry. Thank you for that call to action. Joanne, I might give the floor back to yourself. Yeah, listen, thank you so much, everybody. Um, I have one final question that's after coming through, and um, it's actually um, a question directed at yourself, Paul. Um, so um, Kevin and Fergus have just kind of sat back and kind of said, thank, thank goodness. But um, somebody just put up in the chat, um, are Farrell Furniture seeing opportunities in more Irish timber supply coming from the new government forestry strategy and targets? Um, I'm not sure if that's something you're familiar with or if it's something that that you can speak to. It it, it it's it's not frankly, but but that there's a massive amount of native timber coming online, uh, like in towards the 2040 uh, strategy from from the construction sector. But it's not like we're in in composite materials. We we work with timber, but very very small. And and we work with real woods veneers, so it wouldn't be somewhere I would be know know what's going on. But the government in the in the, the government procurement division that buys that furniture, they have a massive environmental assessment process. Mm -hmm. They're looking at EP um environmental product declarations now, and that you know as as to Geraldine talked about the digital passes and all this, like and that's only one small sector of. You know, the whole budget for the furniture is probably, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 million. So they're looking at everything, sustainability, you know, so so all the other sectors have to do the same, like, you know. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure if that answers, but that's that's what I can tell you. <laughs> um, no, that's great. Listen, I really appreciate it. Um, 
Thank you so much to Geraldine um, and to our panelists, to Paul, to Kevin and to Fergus. Um, it's been a really great session and we're so thankful that you were able to join us today. So we really appreciate it. Um, I'd ask you to pop off your um, screens um, and I'm just going to go through a couple of final slides, um, which I have um, just to talk through at the end um, today. So just one second. Um, I think that should be okay. So um, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, this is the final, um, this is the this is the final webinar in our green transition webinar series. Um, all of the webinars that we've had over the last two months are available on our website on um the Client Solutions Hub on the Global Ambition website and they cover everything from what does the climate action journey look like right through to sustainability reporting and ESG. We covered green skills last week um, and it was brilliant to kind of finish off on the circular economy this week. So I would um, suggest to anybody that wants to kind of listen back um, or missed something that might be relevant to, to log onto our website and check them out. Um, I also want to mention again our Kickstarter workshops, um, sustainability Kickstarter workshops. These are starting on the um, on the on this Friday, and they're kicking off. And um, they're half day workshops um, help to help SME business leaders understand the importance of sustainability and ESG relative to their business. Um, and they've been designed very specifically with SMEs in mind, um, where every participant will walk away at the end of the three hours with a sustainability action plan relative to their business. Um, so anybody here today who's maybe joined a couple of webinars and wants to take the next step, I would wholly request that you sign up to our Kickstarters running between now and the end of the year. Um, they're a great way of kind of digging into sustainability a little bit more and, um, and setting off in your journey around kind of sustainability for, for your business. Um, I also just want to highlight um, some of the, the supports that are available through Enterprise Ireland's Green Transition Fund, um, specifically um, the, the Climate Planning Fund for Business and the Enterprise Emissions Reduction Investment Fund. Um, so I suppose we have a whole array of, of funding that's available um, through Enterprise Ireland, but not only through Enterprise Ireland, we also want to highlight kind of the, the opportunities that, and supports that are available through SCAI. Um, we in Enterprise Ireland always recommend that companies um, interested in sustainability, check out the Climate Toolkit for Business in the first instance to kind of establish your carbon footprint and develop an action plan, as well as to understand the funding landscape that's out there around sustainability supports, because it can be quite um, overwhelming, I think, um, to, to anybody who's trying to figure out where they might sit, whether it's Enterprise Ireland or SEAI or what support to go for when. Um, I highlighted already today the sustainability Kickstarter workshops, and we're really kind of saying to people, this is another opportunity that you have to kind of kick off in your sustainability journey um, and get an understanding of what sustainability means for your business. It's also worth highlighting the SEAI um, energy audit that a voucher that's available to companies to, to get somebody to carry out an energy audit on your on your business, as well as the um, Energy Academy that you can access through the SEAI's website. Um, and then from an Enterprise Ireland perspective, we have the Climate Action Voucher, Green Start, Green Plus, and our strategic consultancy support. And they're kind of the first supports that are available to companies to, um, to, to engage around sustainability. Um, and following that, um, the deeper you want to go as an organization, um, you know, you can access support via our Enterprise Emissions Reduction Investment Fund. And that includes um, metering, um, uh, support, funding support for uh, metering installation, as well as 
um, capital investment for decarbonisation process projects. Um, and beyond that, we also have a full range of supports within our RDI and um, within our RDI division that are relative to sustainability and innovation. Um, so there are significant supports available. The first port of call for any Enterprise Ireland client is to go through your development advisor or log on to our website to find out more. Um, and, you know, as well as that, you can email the um, Enterprise Ireland sustainability team um, at green at enterpriseireland.com um, to find out more about the supports that are available. Um, so, again, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank all of our panellists today and Geraldine, especially um, for being our keynote speaker and also for um, for uh, carrying out the panel as well, the panel piece as well. Um, it's been fantastic. So um, genuinely, thank you so much. And thank you so much for everybody for listening to everybody for listening as well.